appreciate your presence this morning. God does too. And I hope that we'll take our Bible now and open it. But as you open your Bible, be sure to open your heart to what God's Word says. I'm looking at Ephesians 4, verse 19. If you'd like to turn there, Ephesians 4, verse 19 describes people who are darkened in their understanding. And that was us. I can remember that, that stage of my life where I was darkened in my understanding. If a preacher talked about a subject like I'm going to talk about now, it would go right over my head and, of course, right past my heart. It did that numerous times. I didn't get it. And it was because I was darkened in my understanding. Not only that, but verse 19 says, who being past feeling. That is, I wasn't sensitive to the Word of God. I wasn't sensitive to the will of God, particularly in this area, on this particular subject. Somebody talked about lasciviousness. Like I said, I wasn't sensitive to that. I mean, as far as the sinfulness of it. I was involved in it and didn't realize it, but I wasn't sensitive to the sinfulness of it. And so we're past feeling. That's the idea. So he describes people in the world. These are people who have not learned Christ. And having not learned Christ, they've got a completely different outlook. I remember that outlook. Past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness is one term. Lewdness is another term. Or lasciviousness is another term. All three of those, lewdness... Uh, licentiousness is that I, you, inheriting that word is the, that you give yourself license to do more than you really ought to, and therefore it is lascivious in nature. It's lewd. It borders on the things that appeal to the lust of the flesh and doesn't restrain it. If you don't have a sensitivity to the Lord's will, and you're walking around guided by what everybody else is doing, and you're not really thinking about the Lord's will, that's not the first thing you get up with and the, and, and the last thing you go to bed with is the Lord's will. You're thinking about that. If that's not the channel through which your mind operates, then likely it has already been desensitized by the world. The world doesn't have standards like this. So when we're talking about lasciviousness, I want us to understand that we all have a part of us that craves, that desires, that is described as lust. And if you do not channel it, and if you do not control that lust, then it breaks out seeking Free ways to express itself, and that's what lasciviousness is, is uncontrolled. One of, the, one of the definitions is it's unbridled lust. I mean, you have lust, but if you have lust and it's not bridled, then it's going to go automatically into areas that it should not go, like a horse is out in the field. He just goes where he wants to, he goes where the grass is. And that's what, he is, that's what he does. Now, if you want to channel, if you want to guide that horse to do the right thing with you, then, then you put a bridle on him, and then you channel that energy in a certain way. Well, that's what God expects of us. Then we have lusts. We have lusts of the flesh, things that we desire, things that appeal to the lust of the eye. We have those things. Some of those things are things that are dangerous if they're not channeled, if they're not bridled. So when we're talking about this subject, I'm going to ask you uh, young people in particular, because I didn't, I didn't do this. I didn't, I didn't have this knowledge. 
And I want you to have it because I don't want you to make serious mistakes. I want you to understand what it is and what, how and why we ought to control it and channel it in the right way. We're talking about guidelines that will help us so that we're not lascivious in the way that we bridle those lusts or don't bridle them. That's lasciviousness, not bridle them. So you've got to bridle those things. Some of the things that you learn, you look at the world and the world, they, don't, they do not understand these principles and therefore they don't channel. They do not guide those particular lusts. They do not bridle their lusts. And then they begin to be the ones that set the standards for what's cool. Well, I don't know if you still use that word cool, but that was the, that was the word in the 70s. Uh, that was my generation. You had to be cool. If you didn't uh, go with the accepted model and the standards that were set by those that were classified as, as cool, then you were you were not going to fit in. And it was real important to fit in. At least that's the way we think. That's another one of those lusts that's got to be channeled. is trying to fit in, but who are you trying to fit in with? Those are things that we want to, I want to talk to you about. But I, when we get through, I want you to be able to say at the end of this lesson, what do you believe? Not what Terry Benton believes. It's not me against you. This is you and God. And what do you believe before God Almighty, before the judge? What do you believe about this particular topic? And what are you going to adopt in your own life in regard to this particular thing? If you can see that God says, you're not going to go to heaven if you are lascivious. If you support lasciviousness, you're not going to go to heaven. If God put it to you that way, and he does in his word as we are looking at this text, many others point out that you cannot be a person who supports and gives consent to and gives approval to those that are engaged in the different forms of lasciviousness. Now, let me give a comparison. There are some things that play on on covetous desires. Gambling is one of those. You see, the reason gambling is so popular is it plays on covetousness, people wanting something for nothing. And so it plays on that particular desire. And people get hooked on it. And so they gamble and throw away their life savings and their... Uh, the support that they should give their family because this industry latched on to the lust of material things getting something for nothing. That's how it goes. Well, the clothing industry plays on that. It plays on what is going to be acceptable and what is going to sell? Now, if you are a godly person, you look at that through different eyes. You see things through a different lens. You look at things differently. You do not play into gambling. You see where that's going to go. That's playing on lust of the flesh uh, and plays on covetousness and lascivious dress, clothing that appeals to the world is something that also plays on the pride of life as well as the lust of the flesh. So what are you going to believe about this when we get through? What do you believe about lascivious clothing and dancing? I'm going to talk about both of those. I'm going to mainly focus on the first point for the first part of this lesson. But I'd like to, to begin with some considerations here. Who sets the guidelines for you now that you are a Christian? That you, are, you have formed a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, who is going to therefore set the guidelines 
for your standards of dress and activity. If God has said something on this topic, has He? God has said something on this topic. So if God has said something on this topic, then if you are going to be God-fearing and if you're going to be a Christian, here are some things that you're going to have to adopt that the Lord sets the standards. The world doesn't. I understand the world doesn't know Christ. They do not know God. They do not have sensitivity toward God. They don't choose things because of consideration for God. Therefore, what they're going to do is continue the path of sin. They are not going to set the standards for the child of God. Nor do parents, unless parents are first God-fearing people. That would be a strong consideration if you had parents that just doesn't care about this. And then I wouldn't let them set the standards then. The preacher is not the one, nor the elders, nor is it what we've always thought about it. Because, for, like I said, for a long time I always thought about it a certain way. And, and it wasn't guided by the Word of God, I'll tell you that much. So here's a person who wants to dress in harmony with the Bible. And if that is the case, he's going to look at the Bible and he's not going to buck the Bible. He's going to say, I'm going to receive that with meekness. I'm going to listen to that and channel my energies in doing the will of God. If not, and God says, well, you don't love me. You don't know me. God is a God of, of, uh, of holiness. His standards do not match the world's standards at all. Now, look at the reasons people today of the world and sometimes members of the Lord's church dress in inappropriate without that God-fearing sensitivity being past feeling, dress in lascivious and immodest ways. Why do people do that? Well, they do that because they're ignorant. Not that they're, you know, lack intelligence, but they lack information. And that's being ignorant, and they're untaught. A lot of people act that way. Just simply, I did that, just because I was untaught, ignorant. And if you're untaught, then you just want to fit in. That's kind of a, one of those things that just kind of pulls at that lust to fit in, the pride of life and the lust of the flesh, wanting to fit in. But we're wanting to fit in with the wrong people, wanting to be bold. I want people to look at me. I want people to turn their head when I walk by. I want people to see me. That's part of the pride of life. That's one of those things that, that really works on that heartstring where the pride is being appealed to and utilized. Some people do it because they're just careless. They don't stop and think about what they're doing. They don't think about divine principles particularly. They allow the world then to set the standards that influence what they're going to, to do. And when that happens, if God is not the one pulling at the heart strings, pulling us in His direction, then the world is pulling us at their direction. And so we, brethren, sometimes get looser and looser in our styles and in our presentation. We don't know how we really look, especially to godly people and to God. And so sometimes that's a problem. So let's look at God's topic and he confronts us with this topic at the very beginning. At first it was just Adam and Eve. And there was no sin in the world, so you, you don't have to worry about it. And so they were naked, and that wasn't a big deal. You see, that they were naked as husband and wife, that was fine. But then after they sinned, then they began to develop a sensitivity to shame. Shame and sin have now changed the whole concept. My whole mind has now been altered. I look at things differently because now I'm aware of sin. Sin is a real thing in the world and we've got to contend with it. Only thing is, 
when they began to develop that sensitivity, they clothed themselves with an apron. An apron of sewn together of fig leaves. Now, we might say, well, that's better than total nudity. Well, only because we're talking about two people and the world in which they are now in, uh, involved is a world in which sin is a part of it. But even then, did God set a standard? Did he set a minimum did he look at that and say, well, that's okay. At least they got that part covered. An apron. Well, as far as they were concerned, looking at it from their standpoint, that was, that was sufficient. But when they began to consider it from God's standpoint, and God let them know, that's not sufficient. Then what we find then is God then provided a tunic and covered them. And a tunic is known to have covered from the shoulders to the knee. In other words, God said, you are inadequately clothed and I'm going to set the standard. Lack of clothing between Adam and Eve was not an issue until sin entered into the world. And there are other people now to consider, not just themselves. And they've also got to consider that issue of sin. Fig leaves, that's man's insufficient covering. God's tunic equaled an adequate and sufficient covering. And thus God set... A benchmark of sufficient covering. Now, when you consider that, then, that God set the standard higher than these two set it for themselves, that makes us think well, it would God set the, the benchmark higher than what I've set for myself? And if He does, do I not need to raise my standard to fit more in harmony with God's standard? Now, when we look at the New Testament, it it is really based on what God set as the standard from the very beginning. But to Timothy, Paul wrote, in like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Thus, your clothing reflects a sense of modesty. Modesty? is a sense that there is good and evil in this world. And I'm going to reserve myself on the side of righteousness. It's with shamefacedness. That is, I have a sensitivity of shame. I can be shamed. I feel a sense. The world doesn't feel shame because they don't have that sense of of shame. They That comes with a sensitivity toward God and toward sin. But a woman needs to adorn herself with that sense of shamefacedness. Sobriety means that you're clearly thinking, thinking clearly. Particularly thinking clearly about what God thinks and particularly thinking about how I might be advancing sin. I might be supporting sin people's loss. I might be, I might be helping the, the cause of the world and worldliness. And so I'm, I've got to think clearly about this. And that's, that's sobriety. So think clearly about your choice of clothing. Then in verse 10 he says, not all this other stuff, but this, a woman And this applies to the man because God clothed the man too in the garden. So it's not just women. But a woman professing godliness understands her relationship to the advancement of lust and lascivious thought 
and she understands her place in regard to her relationship to the will of God, and so she, she directs her thoughts in terms of what is godly, not what is worldly. And those two things are polarizing thoughts because worldliness and godliness just do not mix together. They're polarizing. They're like magnet, two, two opposite ends of a magnet that you can't push, push them together. Worldliness is one thing and godliness directs in another way. Now I'd like you to notice with me another passage that seems to me to set some guidelines. I'm looking at, well, we've just looked at the issue of nakedness in the garden and how they covered that insufficiently and then God covered it more sufficiently. But turn with me to Exodus 28. I want you to notice Exodus 28 and I'm reading verse 42. Here are the garments that were to be used by the priests. And one thing you need to remember about the priest's work is that they were at the center of the camp. And there was an altar in the center of the courtyard. And especially at times, the priests would have to go up some steps to put the, uh, altar, uh, the offering on the altar. And so God gave them a standard of what to wear. And looking at Exodus 28 verse 42 says, And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs to cover their nakedness. So nakedness is a concern still. From the Garden of Eden to this point, covering that nakedness has been an issue that God wanted people to address. Now, look at the next passage. I'm looking at uh, Isaiah now, 47, and look at verse 2 and 3. Isaiah 47, 2 and 3, does God give us some guidelines on this issue? And the, and the answer comes back a resounding yes. So, Isaiah 47, verse 2 and 3, says, Take the millstones and grind mill." Remove your veil, take off the skirt, uncover the thigh, pass through the rivers, your nakedness shall be uncovered. Well, uncovering the thigh is uncovering your nakedness. And the shame that ought to be enveloping us is that we don't uncover the thigh under normal circumstances unless we're really going to be a shameful people and have ourselves shamed as the Babylonians were in this particular case. So now we've got some standards, we've got some guidelines, we've got some benchmarks that help us to understand that we are to be modest, that is reserved and decent and respectable in what we, uh, what we wear and how we present ourselves. We are to be people who can show a sense of shame, of facetness, uh, uh, the ability to blush. When we get to the point where, like Jeremiah says, my people were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush, then we are already way out there. We've already become too insensitive to our relationship with God. And so related principles to clothing is that it must be modest and it must show that we're concerned about God's standards. We show good judgment. Common sense ought to be used in regard to what we choose, showing that we are related to God and that we're very interested in the will of God, godliness. We're devoted to Him. We're not devoted to the world. We do not owe the world anything except to show them an example of godliness. We ought to respect others, especially the opposite sex and trying to cause people to play and playing on their lust. We ought to respect people. I don't want to play on their lust. And cover our nakedness. Cover from the shoulder to the knee. The clothing should, uh, can be lasciviousness. 
If we're showing our body to show off, then that could be a sign of pride of life. But we can also be trying to stimulate them on their side. It can stimulate lust. What are we trying to do? Play with sin? So we need to be people who are understanding what lasciviousness is. The body, showing the body to get attention. And that can be in various forms. Boys without shirts, short shorts, girls with no back, low low cut, showing cleavage, short shirts and shorts. Those kinds of things, God would say, you're not covering yourself adequately. And God would clothe us better than that. So let's, let's take just a moment now and look at what we've learned so far. Christians do not live in a morally pure world. You don't live in a pure world. But you are to live a life of moral purity in the midst of a world. And so this purity is devoted toward getting to heaven. John 3 says, we don't know what we shall be. But we know when we see him, we will be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And he says, and anybody that has that hope purifies himself so that he'd be ready to see him when he comes. That's really our goal. That's our mission is purity so that we're ready when he comes. With that in mind then, the desired results in the Christian is that we be, yes, in the world, but we're not like the world. We're not of the world. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be that way. And so I know that's what God wants us to be, is people who do not look like the world. Our affections are not on things of the earth, but they're on things of, in heaven. We think differently from the world. We do not conform to the world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind now thinks differently than we, even we used to. And 1 John says, all that's in the world, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, all of that's of the world and the world is passing away. But whoever does the will of God, now that person will abide forever. And James says, pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. As you do not want their filth and their ways to be characteristic of you. Now let's change gears now and look at the subject of of dancing because we're looking at at, uh, forms of lasciviousness. Dancing is defined as an expression of rhythmic movement of an intensified sense of life arising from an inner perception that stimulates both mind and body. That's according to Grolier. Now, that, did, that may not make a whole lot of sense, but combine that with the last one. To move rhythmically to music using prescribed or improvised steps and Gestures. That's the part I want you to focus in, the gestures of... Now, I'm not saying all dance. Any kind of dance is wrong. David's dancing for joy was a dance. I'm not saying every kind of dance is this way. Is, uh, and I'm not saying that we, are, we can't dance for joy when our team wins or that kind of thing. But I'm talking about a certain kind of dance. I'm talking about dance that involves these lusts. And plays on those lusts. Dancing involves close bodily contact, wild gyrations, explicit sexual movements, focusing the body on the sexual appeal to one another, sexual stimulation. That's what is involved in it. Some people say it's just exercise. No, it's not just exercise. It is more than that. There are a lot of these movements that are of a lascivious nature. A.J. Hobbs wrote a tract on this and he stated that of an audience of 1,500 men who were asked the question, how can dance, how can, how many can dance and not have evil thoughts? And not one hand was raised. Because men understand 
And that's really the focus of those kind of dances. So lasciviousness means there are certain lusts of the flesh that have been played upon. We both, we can be lascivious in our outlook. We can be lascivious in our dress, in the way that we move ourselves, present ourselves before others. And this passage says, you better be very careful and not deceive yourself because such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. When you look at the definition of it, it is described as unbridled lust, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. It's tending to produce lewd emotions. The testimony of the world is that if you remove the sexual aspects, the things that appeal to the sexes, it will kill the dance because it's not just bodily exercise as some people would like to. It involves bodily contact, lewd movements, boys with girls. Now, somebody might say, well, that's just all in the evil thoughts of the person. Do these same movements with a boy with boy. And what somebody will say is, are you, are you a homosexual? Why? Because those movements are sexual in nature. If they saw you doing the same movements on the floor with a male, they would say, you must be homosexual. Why? Because it's not just exercise. And you know it's not. So it's a male with female, and it's based upon the sexual appeal, the bodily opportunity to to be able to touch and to view and to move in a certain way. There's a sexual aspect to that. If you stop the music and you were just doing those same movements, you know what people would think? They're they're petty. That's what, what comes to mind. You don't look, take the music out and see these same movements and say, oh, that's just exercise. No, there's more to it than that. In many of the modern dances, and I'm saying modern, I'm including my generation and, and on back, but especially we're seeing that more and more common in, uh, in the youth of our time. So if it's just harmless exercise, then then you could do that with a friend and not be accused of homosexuality. You, would, you wouldn't make those same moves in that way towards somebody of the same sex unless you did want to be thought of as homosexual. So it's not just innocent exercise. Another thought is, could you do those things with God in mind? That is, you're moving that way and talking to them about the Bible, talking to them about God. And most people would say, "Ah, I'd feel uncomfortable doing that. Well, you should, because those are not proper for a person professing godliness. So in conclusion, let me say this. Paul, to a young man, told Timothy, you've got to run away from those lusts. That is, you've got to handle yourself Nobody's going to handle you but you. Nobody can tell you how to dress and how to conduct yourself but God and you. That is if you're concerned about the will of God. And if you are concerned about the will of God, then you're going to have to flee, run from those particular lusts that will lead you into other uh, forms of lascivious behavior and sexual immorality. Not only that, but you can't just go along with others doing it either. To Timothy, he says, you you do not participate in other people's sins. That means you keep yourself pure from it. That means there will be choices. There will be times when worldly friends will not understand you. That may be a great opportunity for you to say, but I fear God and I love God. That may be an opportunity when they don't understand your thinking that you already have your thinking in place. That your thinking is, I know you don't understand this, but this is what I believe the will of God is. Then when you can say that, 
you can confess Jesus without shame. If you're not embarrassed to stand up for the Lord, then you're standing in a good position. A lot of people will look at you and they will respect you for your convictions. But no one respects a person who doesn't stand by their convictions. So flee youthful lust because you believe that. You believe it's important. Don't be a participant in other people's sins because you believe that. Not because I believe it, but because you do. And I believe that. That's for myself. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That is, you stay away from anything that is evil that appears on the scene and it has an evil connotation to it. It has an evil impact or an evil lascivious appearance. With those principles in mind, brethren, if you believe those things, you will be a difference maker in this world. You will be a light. But if we just look like the world all the time, we act like the world, we dress like the world, we talk like the world, then we're not, like Jesus said, you are a light and you put it under a bushel and nobody's going to see that you are a difference maker. We've got to be different. And we must not conform to the world. I hope this morning you understand that better than I did before. And I hope that you understand it now so that you can be a difference maker in your own behavior. God is putting that responsibility on you and each one of us. So if you're here this morning, you've never done that, you've never obeyed the gospel, you never surrendered your life to God completely, surrender it completely now. Come and repent of your sins, confess your faith in Jesus, take a stand with Him and be buried with Jesus in baptism. Rise to walk in newness of life.